All right, so here's what we got. Uh, on the one hand, I've got my new Origin Bison boots, which are just uh, completely pristine and beautiful. And I've also got my old uh, Coronados, which I have completely just put through the paces and beat the heck out of. And uh, as you can see, they're still going strong. And uh, given where we are going today, well, I can tell you, uh, it's going to be a Coronado kind of day. in the dog white sector and on the morning of June 6th this area right here is where General Norman Cota would have landed uh, at uh, about an hour to an hour and a half after the the first wave landed and it was also right here in this area that the Americans were going to achieve the very first breakthrough right here in the dog section of Omaha Beach. All right, well, we are here on this breakwater in the dog white sector of Omaha. And uh, if you look off in the distance, you know, right in here, uh, that is the original seawall that would have been uh, here on Omaha Beach, except for there would have been a shingle right up next to it. And uh, off to my right is the dog green sector of Omaha Beach. And uh, as you can see, we've got a, a daggum sandstorm blowing in. I'm going to be chewing on sand for a week. Uh, but on the morning of the 6th, whenever General Coda was coming in, uh, Dog Green was looking a little bit too rough. So they diverted over here to Dog White, where he would have seen elements of D Company of the 116th Infantry Regiment all scattered out through here. And uh, General Coda, who was the Assistant Division Commander for the 29th, started the work of organizing these men uh, along with elements of the 5th Ranger Battalion. And it's also here where the Rangers are going to get their motto whenever Coda told Schneider, Rangers, lead the way. So we are here on Dog White, and this is the section of the beach where General Coda found himself. Uh, he was part of the, uh, the front row on LCVP-71. Uh, this is a boat that's meant to be commanders, essentially. Most of the guys on board were officers, and their job is to kind of move off an established beachhead. The problem was it is not yet an established beachhead. So what Cota does first, is on the beach there, he starts organizing these men who've landed earlier and saying, you know, looking at who's in charge, looking at who's got control, and saying, okay, you are, there you are, Corporal. Here's five men who can be with you, and there's another guy there. Looks like he's doing some a good job, so I'll put those three guys with you. He hasn't got a plan yet. What he's doing is he's putting the infrastructure, the organization, back in. Meanwhile, his aide, Lieutenant Jack Shea, has moved up the seawall and has recognized there is just a little bit of a valley behind me there, a draw. It's not very much, but we're in between German defenses here. There's a Vita Stonsnes to my left and my right, but they're you know, a quarter of a mile away. And he's wondering whether they can use that as a defilade and get a break off the beach and then come round and envelop some of the German positions from behind. The difficulty though is going to be getting to that draw because all this bit here is landmines and barbed wire. So we've moved uh, just a, a little bit to the area where Coda and the men that he had organized uh, moved through and uh, started moving up this draw. So, so the draw is kind of behind that house. Now Paul mentioned that this whole area would have been just strewn with mines. So they had to get some Bangalore torpedoes up here to blow a section out that they could move through. And this is the very spot where they blew a hole in the lines that allowed men to go through. Now the first guy ended up getting shot and there's a, a little bit of a delay in action. People kind of stammering around trying to figure out what to do next after this guy has been killed. So Coda himself takes his pistol in hand and starts leading the way up this draw. And Paul has a, a pretty interesting theory. 
Now, there's no way to prove it for sure, but if you see there's a, a ditch right here, uh, he thinks that it's possible that the Bangalore torpedo that blew a hole right here uh, ended up kind of diverting the water and creating this ditch that we see today. All right, so anyway, we're, we're going to get off of this windy beach and uh, move up the draw in the path of General Coda. All right, so we've moved up here into the draw, and uh, right now the, the beach as we see it is pretty close to what it would have looked like at, uh, at this time on D-Day whenever Coda and the, the guys that he is leading are coming up the draw. So just for the sake of reference, let me zoom in here. There is the breakwater that we started off at, and then right there in that spot is where the Bangalore torpedo opened up a gap in the wall. They would have advanced right up kind of into this area to where we are standing now. And look at this. There is, a, it, it looks like a road almost uh, going up to the top. So as we are walking up here, this is going to to be the access point that Coda finds and leads his men up to, to the top and behind the German defenses. Okay, so I'm, I'm walking up Coda's draw right now. And this is really one of those times where getting out on the ground really helps you to understand what happened. This is something that you can't really see in, in a map uh, or uh, in a, a description or anything else. But as you can see, I mean, I'm kind of just down in, in this bowl. What this did is it allowed Coda and his men to kind of stop and take a little bit of a breather. You're, you're kind of protected right here in this area. So after they had time to kind of reassess uh, what was going on and form a plan, well then they continued up the draw, really not knowing what was going to be up there uh, to try and, and break this German defensive line. Okay, so right now we're coming up out of the draw and let me turn back and show where we just came out of. Okay, so obviously here is the, the draw that Coda and his men advanced up on D-Day. And if you come up here, this is approximately the view that they would have had whenever they reached the top of the bluff. Now there was a hedgerow up here at the time that is no longer here. And back here in, in this position amongst all of this brush, uh, there was a German machine gun position that had two dead Germans in it. Uh, they weren't killed by uh, gunfire, uh, but were probably killed maybe by the naval bombardment uh, ahead of time. So once they, they get up here, off in this direction, well, that's where the Vierville draw is. So again, as Paul mentioned earlier, we're kind of in between strong points. And you might ask the question, why didn't the Germans just have you know, a line of defenses all along this bluff. Well, they didn't necessarily know that the invasion was going to take place here and they had 5,000 miles of Atlantic seacoast to cover. But yeah, right here is where, uh, where Coda and his men started breaching these German defenses. We have moved maybe 100 yards west of the top of Cota's draw. We're now in the area where the 5th Rangers came up and they're not using quite as large a draw as Cota, 
it, but there are these little switchbacks and cuttings that are off to my left here, and fives and six and twos and threes, these guys are coming up here. And there's a hedgerow just behind me there, and it's that one that the fifth rangers used to move their way in towards vieville sur -Mer. Cota's men take up the hedgerow over here. And by aiming for the church tower, they head for vieville sur -Mer. And about 30 or 40 of Cota's men, I guess joined in with some of the fifth rangers, take out Vida Stons Nest 70, which is the next German position behind me, maybe two fields behind me. Now that's been busy firing at targets left and right on the beach. And the 30 or, four me 30 or 40 men who attack it from behind, what they've done is they've eliminated weaponry that is firing somewhere else down the beach. The thing about Omaha beaches and all the beaches is by the weaponry being interlocking and firing down the beach, you can lead a platoon of men off the beach, knock out the German machine gun or, or artillery piece that's straight ahead of you, you've not made your life any better because it's firing half a mile down to the right or a mile down to the left. What you're doing though is you're freeing up the bit of beach a mile to your left for someone else to make a movement. It's a domino effect. Each time a position gets knocked out, a part of the beach, left or right, is becoming a bit quieter, a bit easier to move off. So one leads to another, that leads to another. And with all these events happening at the same time, and there are other breakthroughs off the eastern section of Omaha Beach by elements of the 1st Division, the battle is swinging in the favour of the Americans. And by late morning on June the 6th, uh, so many of these German positions have now been eliminated. It's a much quieter environment down there. Units are coming ashore, your armour's coming in, your engineers are coming in. But it's all because of these little breakthroughs like this one here, of half a dozen guys there, half a dozen guys there and 130 guys with Kota who are using this terrain to their advantage and getting off the beach and getting in behind the Germans. Alright, so we've moved uh, a little bit east from where we were here along the bluffs. And this is the approximate position of WN70. So the, the Germans have these gaps in the lines. Whenever you look at a, an aerial map or, or something like that, everything looks flat. Well, there are these little dips and swales. So from right here, I mean, even without the veg vegetation, you, you can't see back in the direction of Coda's draw. So that would have allowed them to, to come up and then if you look back here along this horizon line, well, that's Vierville. So they would have advanced along through here and then hit the Vierville draw. Some of the uh, elements along with Coda would have been dodging down in here to take out these German positions from behind. So, so we're gonna kind of move back in this direction now. Alright, so behind me is the town of Vierville. So we, we've kind of made our way through there. And right now we are walking along the, the original D1 draw here at Vierville. So there's, there's a road that traffic goes along. That's, that was added later. This was all expanded out. This is the original route. So uh, Coda and his men would have been making their way right in this direction as they were kind of advancing behind these German positions that were covering the Vierville exit. Now after making their way through Vierville, uh, Norman Cota's men would have had to have made their way down the D1 draw which goes along this bike path right here. And one of the German strong points that was going to provide a lot of problems was this one right here. Now there's a lot of overgrowth there now, uh, but that is a concrete bunker that kind of forms a 90 degree angle that covers really the entirety of this draw. And I've wanted to go up there before, but didn't know how to get there without getting on private property. Uh, but Paul happens to know uh, a way in. Real quick, here is one of the mortar to brooks up here overlooking the D1 draw. So from, from this position, the Germans who were manning this particular mortar to brook could have fired on anybody coming up the D1 draw, 
Uh, they also could have fired on anybody out here past the horizon line that was coming up on the beach. Okay, so we just got here on, on top of the bluff and right down here is the, the D1 draw, just for reference. And that bunker that we just referenced is uh, buried somewhere here in this pile of brush. Uh, probably doable. Good grief. This is a, holy cow, this is a jungle in here. Oh man, I'm hung up. Oh yeah, because you've got the camera. Do you want to pass the camera down? Are you alright? Oh no, I think I got it. Right, are you up for this? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> now there's off the beaten track. And there's off the beaten track, right? So, yes. Wait, you're telling me you have the car today. <laughs> okay, we're getting down in through some brush here uh, to get down into this bunker and uh, we're, we're hoping that there isn't some uh, dead um, messed out French hobo uh, sleeping on a soggy mattress in here but holy cow all right here we go okay dang this is a tiny little passageway here Oh, let's go dark here for a second. All right. All right, let me adjust my lighting. <laughs> Welcome to my parlor, said the spider to the fly. <laughs> no, your BBC don't come in places like this. <laughs> There's the hobo mattress. <laughs> so whenever I was saying something about a hobo on a mattress, wasn't even lying. <laughs> here, let's hold this light. Right here, please. All right. So, uh, this this is kind of this is the kind of stuff that I I love to do is kind of finding these obscure places and uh, digging into them. So you can imagine on on D Day, I, I'll show the the view here in just a second. But you would have had. Uh, a German machine gun crew. Uh, I'm not exactly sure like what model of machine gun would have been here, uh, but no matter what they had, uh, this this would have been just a a formidable position. So from right here, in this port, well, you're firing right out across the the Vierville draw, and then from this spot right here, well, you can fire right up the road. So anybody. Uh, coming in off of the beach is going to be covered. Anybody who's trying to come in from behind is going to be covered. Uh, and yeah, I, I've seen this place before from the outside, but getting inside is, is really something else. So again, here is the, the view from that first port that I showed covering you know the, the draw in this direction. And then if I swing over here, it's gonna be dark for just a second, but there you can see the view from up the road. Gosh, I am so glad that we walked as far as we did to come and see this because it is worth it. Well, this is a, a twin embrasure German machine gun position. This is a type that's kind of mounted into a, a kind of steel frame behind it, a sort of similar to the short barreled gun that covers the jaw there. And this position was taken out by Cota's men coming in from behind. But I say taken out, I'm not sure exactly how much gunfire went on here because more likely is that by the time he comes in from behind there, we're maybe talking as late as sort of 10 o'clock in the morning, these guys are probably out of ammo. It's more like preventing them kind of escaping and kind of cutting off and isolating them. Um, there may have been a little bit of ammo left, but I don't know there was much of a firefight here, but it definitely eliminates this position and ceases it as a threat for Americans who are going to be coming up this draw later on. There's still an anti-tank wall that is yet to be blown at the foot of the draw, but by later part of D-Day, there are all sorts of American troops coming up this draw who can now do so, uh, confident that there's no weaponry in here that can get them, because as you can see, the, the position this has overlooking the draw is, is really formidable. Okay, uh, that was legitimately awesome. 
Uh, I, I've done another video talking about you know Omaha Beach from the German perspective. That really adds a whole lot to it. All right, have uh, one more quick stop here talking about Coda's route on D-Day. All right, so I'm now making my way down towards the end of the D1 draw. We've got a, a cluster of vehicles that are right in the spot where the, the Germans would have had uh, really kind of like two walls that were designed to block vehicular traffic. So pedestrians could get through, but they wanted to keep any, any tanks and Jeeps and things like that from coming up off of the beach. So just for the sake of reference, there's the German bunker with the 88 millimeter gun and the National Guard monument on top. And right here is where that wall would have been. So Coda would have made his way down here and uh, procured uh, a whole bunch of explosives, had them brought up here, blew a hole in the wall. And with that, on the afternoon of June 6th, the Vierville draw would have been opened. After the engineers made a breach in the seawall, uh, Coda made his way back up the draw and to this spot where I am right now, of course you can see these road signs, and then started leading men towards Point de Hawk to relieve the rangers there. And made this huge like odyssey on D-Day that maybe was seven or eight miles as a 51 year old man. So anyway, it's pretty cool today to be able to kind of retrace the path of uh, General Coda, get on the ground and, and understand a little bit more of what happened right here on D-Day.